Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hispanic Heritage Foundation's weekly virtual community Charles series. I'm Antonio Tijerino from the Hispanic Heritage Foundation. As you can see by my shirt, it says, No Tengo Dinero, um, and I'm proudly deep in my 50s. This Charla is very important to me personally. This afternoon's Charla is about retirement and is hosted by AARP. Who else, right? What other organizations more concerned about how we're doing today and how we're doing tomorrow than AARP? Over the next few months, AARP is bringing a special series of charlas to our unique platform focused on salud, dinero, y amor. These days, we're all in great need of all three. And so I wanna thank you, AARP. We are proud to have a sponsor that pushes us to create these spaces of conversation with our community and our entire community, which includes those preparing for retirement or retired. I appreciate the leadership of Yvette Peña and Veronica Segovia, who we will hear from in a few minutes, and everyone over at ARP. During this retirement, Charla, speakers will share with you their personal stories, their experiences, their challenges and triumphs, and of course, resources, um, information to help all of you in the audience start thinking about your own retirement. A special thank you to our good friend, Abby Zapote from Latinos for a Secure Retirement for being part of this conversation and who has been at the forefront of this issue. Uh, very proud to have her as a friend and as somebody that I can I go to for advice on these issues. Um, and we welcome her voice and leadership on this matter. We have hosted Abby at our loft lab uh, where we were office mates and we missed the chismes and the abrazos and the cafecitos that we have shared over the last couple of years. Um, but these days, not everyone is going to the office anymore. Your moderator for today is Veronica Segovia, who is a senior advisor at ARP. Veronica is working to impact lives across areas that matter most to Latinos. Again, salud, dinero, y amor. In her role, Veronica applies more than 10 years of experience in digital, social, and mobile communications to reach consumers on key issues of health security and financial resilience across key channels. Veronica also holds a BA Communications Public Relations from the mighty University of Maryland, where she serves as the Board of Governors for the University's Alumni Association for its College of Arts and Humanities. Go Terps, I'm Tony Terrapin. Uh, please welcome now Veronica Segovia. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tony. Uh, I appreciate the Go Terps, absolutely. And I have a 17 month old son who's also Antonio. So I'm gonna start calling him Terp Tony as well. Um, and thank you to Hispanic Heritage Foundation for hosting these weekly community charlas. Today's discussion, as we've mentioned, focuses on Latino retirement, its challenges, triumphs, and resources. Our panel of respected guest speakers is here to help families in our Latino community find ways to best prepare for the unexpected amidst this COVID crisis. COVID has brought more debt and concerns about retirement for older Hispanic Americans, as well as different segments of the population. And the data shows us that these financial strains started as early as May. Household debt is growing and that's no surprise as 42% of those who are employed have lost their income due to workplace closures or a forced reduction in hours. I realize that I have a lot of privilege. I'm part of that 16% of Latinos who can work from home. We know that almost 20% of Latinos are tapping into their emergency savings and that same percentage of older Hispanic Americans have had to delay payments on one or more of their bills. So what does this mean for the long-term financial situation? What are the long-term financial repercussions of this virus and what do they look like? We know that this pandemic will likely have a negative effect on our retirement. And half of us are already concerned about having to dip into our retirement savings just to pay for everyday necessities and expenses. What about postponing retirement? If you're contemplating this thought, you're not alone as 43% of Hispanic Americans are discussing delaying their retirement. This is a real concern and an understandable one. We also know that the virus is affecting the health and wellness of Latino communities disproportionately. One in five older Hispanic Americans have had to put their fears aside and place themselves at work at, at risk of exposure to the virus because they simply could not afford to stay home. What's more, over half of older Hispanic Americans have concerns that they won't be able to afford testing, let alone treatment for COVID if they need it. With all of these concerns, the last thing any of us needs is to be swindled out of our hard-earned money by a scammer, but it happens every day. COVID scammers are preying on us, but especially our older population. 
with 43% of older Hispanic Americans worried about becoming a victim of a COVID scam, the best thing we can do is keep each other informed. AARP has some excellent resources in their Fraud Watch Network. If you know of a scam or have and want to report one, uh, I invite you to reach to check out aarp.com Fraud Watch Network in English or aarp.com slash fraude in Spanish. I encourage us all to educate ourselves and stay on top of these scammers. We want to provide you with information and resources that you all need. Uh, and, and it's all available online and for free. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to be a card carrying, carrying member of AARP to access these resources. So I urge all of us to take advantage of that simply by visiting aarp.org slash money in English or aarp.org slash dinero in Spanish for more information. We also have a new tool called Money Map, and that can help you to get your finances back on track with plans of action. It's free to anyone over the age of 18, and you don't have to be a member to use it. You can find it online at moneymap.aarp.org. And for the latest resources on coping with the impacts caused by COVID-19, please visit aarp.org slash coronavirus or aarp.org slash el coronavirus in Spanish. Okay, there's one last thing I wanna mention because I have your attention at the beginning of this charla. And ladies, entrepreneurs, this one is for you. It's a program called Latina Mentors. AARP is sponsoring We All Grow's program. It's a three-part Latina Mentors class and Latina Mentors Fund exclusively for Latina entrepreneurs. It's a video class and once you've completed it, you can apply for $3,000 in funding to help you with your entrepreneurial dreams. But you must do it before August 17th. You can find all the information for that at weallgrow.com slash Latina Mentors. And now I'll introduce Abby Sapote from Latinos for a Secure Retirement in DC. As their executive director, Abby leads a coalition of national Latino organizations to advocate for social security, Medicare, increased pension access, and greater financial literacy for Latinos of all ages. Abigail is a true gem. She's one of my sheroes and a strong advocate for the Latino community. Her work at Latinos for a Secure Retirement in includes organizing grassroots events to bring financial literacy and retirement readiness programs to millennial Latinos and our families. She's testified in Congress as an advocate for Latinos on topics surrounding social insurance and hosting summits to bring together Latino leaders, policy stakeholders, and congressional members. She also serves on the executive board of the Democratic National Committee's Senior Coordinating Council. We're honored to have her on our virtual stage today. Abby, take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Vero, for the great introduction. Um, and thank you as well, Tony, for having me uh, to be part of this uh, charla as well. You know, as we're talking about uh, retirement, it always seems like it's such a difficult topic to talk about because it always seems like it's so far away, like it's unattainable. And the way that we at Latinos for a Secure Retirement like to talk about uh, the topic of retirement is actually to talk about love, to talk about security, and to talk about the responsibility that we have not only to ourselves, but to our families and our communities. We know that, uh, when we talk about retirement, the first thing that folks think about is social security and how that's gonna be really the only program that will be available for folks to, um, to get them out of poverty when they retire. But first, I'd like to go into the next, uh, into the next slide to really talk about how difficult talking about retirement in, is. Especially because as Veronica mentioned during her uh, remarks, is that in April, about 50% of Latinos lost a job, took a pay cut, or both. And not only that, but about a third of Latinos are also having to use their retirement savings to be able to get them across the finish line of the, what the next month holds. On the next slide, I'll talk about why talking about retirement is so complex. When we talk about economic security as a whole, we also have to talk about how much um, the economy as a whole is affecting the Latino community, especially when we know that Latinos are more likely to do service work that's classified as essential during this pandemic. Our community is literally the one that's driving the economic forces right now. And also the fact that we're still dealing with a wage gap we're still dealing with our community not getting paid sufficiently enough in general because the um, 
minimum wage payment is still at 725. It has not changed since I was about 18 years old and I'm turning 30 this year. So that's a huge gap that's not keeping up with inflation. And at the end of this, our community is also not getting that hazard pay that we need to make sure that yes, even though we're out in the field and not only in the physical field, making sure that uh, food is harvested in the health field with our do uh, documented um, students that make a huge portion of the folks that are part of that healthcare system, but that um, the day-to-day -day, um, deliveries, the day-to-day -day, um, cleaning, the day-to-day -day of just how much our community is actually physically a part of the day-to-day um, -day, uh, work service, we are not being put at the forefront of protecting those people and protecting their healthcare. In the next slide, I also talk about how a big portion of Latinos are unemployed, which means that not only are they losing, are they losing their wages, but they're also uh, losing the health insurance that was provided by their employer. So really putting Latinos in a very difficult situation where uh, on the next slide, I'll also talk about how not only do we have less access to um, healthcare services, but also lower access to nutrition. This makes it to where talking about retirement is so, so far away from the priorities that our communities are really looking at every single day. And with that being said, the way that we want to talk about this is that yes, we need to um, have the initial conversation on retirement because that is so difficult for our communities to talk about, especially at a time where our community is four times more likely to um, not, uh, well, to acquire the coronavirus, but our community is also dying because of this virus. And so unless we're protecting not only ourselves, but our assets, we, will not be able to get out of this situation wholesomely. And on the next slide, I'll show you guys what I think about when I think about retirement. And to me, when I think about it initially, I think about my mom. My mom just turned 51 years old. Um, I was able to take her with me uh, to um, a great trip to uh, New Orleans where I was also uh, host, uh, being hosted as a speaker. But that's when I realized that when I think about what she has to go through, when I think about um, her attaining citizenship only five years ago, it means that it really puts her at a vast disadvantage of other people her age. And so with that, um, on the next slide, I'll talk about how love is really the centermost point of what we should be thinking about when we're thinking about retirement. And that love comes from the love that we have for our community and making sure that programs like social security are being expanded and saved from cuts. That love is also for uh, what we have in front of our families and how we know that as Latinos within our culture, we are, um, we live in multi-generational households and we are part of that whole family unit. But at the same time, when we're thinking about retirement, we should also think about it in a personal way of how we are going to be able to accrue enough money to create a nice nest egg for our retirement as a whole. And I know that a lot of you guys come across uh, some, of the, some of the different myths or the different ways that our families talk about this. One of them is, yo voy a trabajar toda mi vida, or I'll work as long as I'll have to or mis hijos me van a cuidar cuando me jubile, or my kids are gonna be my retirement plan. And while these are notions of family and care, caregiving and love that we, we can still focus on, we also need to think about all of the different um, ways that we can secure our finances when throughout our lifetime to ensure that we do have that nice nest egg at the end of our lifetime. In the next slide, we talk about security and what that financial security looks like and what retirement security looks like. First and foremost, I know that our communities love to celebrate our successes, love to celebrate baptisms, las quinceañeras, and all of that stuff that makes our culture so beautiful. But I think we can also use these as different ways to invest in our communities. And the first way would be creating, investing in education and creating a 529 uh, tuition plan for our kids. 
protecting ourselves by acquiring health insurance and life insurance. And even though sometimes those seem far away, we can still um, be able to access those in the private market um, to be able to secure ourselves at the end of our lifetimes. Also being able to create multiple streams of income for ourselves. And while sometimes, again, that seems very difficult, we can turn that side, side hustle into an actual LLC. And we're, uh, with the help of our different partners, we also provide different programming to make that accessible to you all. And I think now more than ever, folks really understand their savings and spending patterns as we know that um, we've had to reduce our actual spending um, by not going out. And lastly, on that financial security is being able to use credit, credit wisely. We know that there are a lot of um, uh, ways that our, our community gets um, scammed into different um, credit uh, utilizations of credit or even, um, you know, the only access that some folks actually have to a banking institution are payday lending um, places. And so really being able to use um, tools that are uh, available to us by our partners is also very helpful and useful. And then for our own retirement, we don't have to think about that um, as a time in the future that we have to start thinking about it. We can start it as early as possible. And for the first time in our lifetime, being young is an asset. And a conversation that we, I've had with Tony is that the most common age of a Latino in the United States is 11 years old, which means that there is so much time not only for us to learn, but to be able to share this information with our kids because they are so young and because we can really get their investments um, you know, on the up and up as, um, as their age makes it so that they can live through the different wavelengths of the um, rising and lowering of the markets. And I'll, the, the last thing that I'll say here is the responsibility that we have to our communities to vote, to fill out the census, to expand social security, to fight for the increase of minimum wage and labor protections, fighting for debt-free college and student debt forgiveness and fighting for universal family care. On the family front, helping our family members access those programs and services that are going to be able to help them not only um, access social security, but also Medicare and other different um, local, state, and federal services that are, that are available. And on the financial front, even if you don't know where to get started, know that there is help available for you. And with that, we also are um, partnering with AARP on a couple of different programs, but um, also highlighting the money map and how we can help folks get out of debt, how we can help them create their estate plans to make sure that they're leaving their family members um, uh, you know, with the foundation to create that generational wealth. And um, on, that, on the last page is where I invite you all to join us for our next Cafecito y Dinero event. This is going to be on August 12th and focusing on, with Veronica, um, and really focusing on how we can divert not necessarily divert, but how we can use the weights that we celebrate our triumphs, our successes as a community, but also to make sure that we're using those celebrations as ways to um, create a platform for our folks so that they can start investing. Um, and that really starts with investing in our families and our communities. Thank you all so much. Um, and I'm excited to hear what everybody else has to say about retirement. Thank you so much, Abby. And thanks for the shout outs to the future events. I'm excited. I hope all of you will be able to join us. I hope our friends at Hispanic Heritage Foundation will help us uh, push those links out as well so that we stay in touch with everybody. Uh, I'm really excited to get to our next panelist. We have a group of nine more folks for everyone to hear from. Um, and I'm really looking forward to these personal experiences, lived experiences to be shared with us today. So next, I'm going to hand it off to Tatiana Torres. Director of External Affairs on the Economic Recovery Team uh, for the Office of Muriel Bowser. So, Tatiana. Thank you so much, Veronica. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to share with family. Uh, to my brother, Tony, thank you for the invitation and to your wonderful team. Um, I'm gonna make this a little bit personal and tell you about Las Tres Comadres. Um, and I wanted to share with you, as Abby was saying, like this is, uh, more than what I do for work um, and what I'm seeing every day on the recovery and the impacts that COVID has on, on our communities and communities of color in general. Um, I live this every day personally at my own home. Um, so what happens when a 38 year old like me uh, has children that are over the age of 60? 
Next slide. Well, you get Las Tres Comadres. You get Mi Abuelita Evelia, who um, lives in my home. Next slide. You get Mommy, as you can see, joyful, happy, uh, rambunctious, strong. Uh, Abuelita is close to 90. Mommy just turned 71. Uh, so that's her 2020 happy smile that you see in that picture. Uh, she, none of us knew what was happening around the corner from that day, but she was excited nonetheless and continues to be about life. She is my rock. Um, she is one of the, the, my best friend and um, she has given everything up for me. She migrated along with my dad and my brother uh, from Colombia to here. Next slide. And then you have La Otra Comadre, which is my aunt Yolanda. We call her Titi Yoli. Um, all three of these wonderful ladies that you're seeing um, are a big part of my life and they are my children. I don't have children of my own, um, but as we've spoken, uh, a lot of our parents, especially those that are immigrants depend on, on us um, when it comes to retirement um, and for us to take care of them. My mother uh, who worked in the US gave everything for me um, and by working and cleaning. So I'm able to proudly say uh, I've, I'm a public servant. I've been in the private sector, public sector because of the education and the sacrifices that my parents have made for me. Um, many Latinos, I can't say all, but most I would think uh, do not believe in nursing homes. So when Abuelita's house uh, was completely torn apart by a hurricane in Florida, um, I have been blessed to have a big enough house where Abuelita was uh, was moved to immediately so I could take care of her. So she became my first child at the age of 88. Um, and then mom, um, as you can see, as happy as she could be, had a, a pretty serious um, health condition, um, no retirement, um, no health insurance. Um, so she had to forego and, and move out of New Jersey where we were raised um, to come and live at my house as well. Um, and then Titi Yoli's company closed down uh, not too long ago due to COVID and to other, other issues that um, she faced also in Florida. Um, and she, this is a home for everyone. So of course she has come in here and, and has, has been unemployed for the past couple of months. Um, so these women are my rock, next slide. Um, but they are also, um, they have also helped me understand a lot about my own, my own retirement. Um, my own understanding of, of what I need to do uh, for myself um, as I retire so that when I do have children and, and I'm married, I don't have to have that burden that unfortunately, because of life circumstances, right, um, they were not able to attain in their own retirements, uh, all three of them. Um, you know, so, so it's, it's, it's um, what are the challenges? What are the lessons that I've learned about Latino retirement before the age of 40? Well, I got to get my own stuff straightened out first if I want to continue, if I don't want to, uh, if I want to make a difference in, in my future family. Um, so some of the challenges is that, and that is that I'm the sole breadwinner at my home right now. Thankfully, um, I am so blessed to have a great job and, and serve in the District uh, of Columbia currently right now, obviously working on a lot of external affairs. So I see my own life and my own experience reflected in a lot of the lives of other folks um, that are not so blessed and lucky to be able to have a job right now. Those in the hospitality industry, those in the restaurant industry, which are our people mostly, um, like uh, Abby and Veronica said, they are essential. And uh, unfortunately, um, they don't have the opportunity to have uh, kids that are able to, at times, to, to be able to sustain three or four people in their house on one salary. Um, so some of the challenges that sometimes it is draining, and I'll be honest and vulnerable, um, it is, it, it is draining uh, sometimes to, to be the sole breadwinner, um, but the, the opportunity and security that our parents and our grandparents and aunts and uncles and, uh, and, and mom and dad provided for us when we were kids, it, it's the reward of going back and saying, here you go. Uh, this is what we can do for you, especially when parents came into the country undocumented looking for safety um, from the, uh, you know, the, the threats in our own countries and native countries. Um, so the challenges is being the own breadwinner. The challenges is sometimes, as many of you can only imagine, having um, women underneath the same roof cannot be easy, especially multi-generational women. Um, it's not easy, um, but it is an opportunity to learn about oneself again and personal growth um, and how to be able to deal with, with um, the sun setting of, of the life of, of, for example, my grandmother, right? Which we hope lives another 10 years, but we have to come to realization that that can or cannot be uh, the possibility. My faith is my bedrock and, and everything that I believe in. Um, and I think that the first thing I could say about my faith is you in my own personal life, you love God, you love people. You can't do one without the other. 
Um, so, and that starts at home. You can't talk about public service and serving outside in the community um, if the community doesn't start first at home. Um, and I take that very personal uh, to my faith and to my beliefs. Um, so that is something that I've, I've learned, um, some of the lessons I've learned about community in the house um, and what that means. Uh, the triumphs have been growth, have been an understanding of past histories that I never knew that grandma sometimes sit there and tell stories that none of us have heard about before or on, or, or just seeing the way that the dynamics are within a home, the good things and the bad. Um, so those are some things that I've learned. Uh, resources, reaching out to my community is huge. Um, reaching out to those that, um, you know, it's ARP and calling and, and, and making sure that I'm a resource to them with their limited language skills as well. Um, but also um, making sure that I'm a resource to others in the community as I'm doing external affairs to other corporate companies, stakeholders, nonprofit organizations, the safety net community. How can my, my, uh, my experience at home uh, be similar to others that are living the same thing uh, by sustaining their their uh, elderly uh, family members. And then the opportunities uh, to be able to look at my own finances. Uh, I just actually recently um, set up a, 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 my own retirement and state plan. Also did one for my mom uh, just a couple of months ago. Um, given with COVID, the uncertainty of these times could be very threatening. Um, and we wanted to make sure that she was, uh, that her request and her voice was heard even after um, she passed. And I want the same for myself in terms of looking at retirement. So one of the biggest lessons I've learned is uh, taking care of my own house, meaning me, um, and where I'm in retirement, making sure that, um, you know, if, if, if there's something I don't desperately need to buy right now, uh, not to just be tempted to put it on the credit card, but um, know that that could be served for other purposes and also to be given back to others outside my family. Um, so those are some of the lessons I've learned personally. Um, I am, uh, I know that this is a time where a lot of our families in our community are experiencing dolor uh, of all types, physical, mental, spiritual, uh, social. Um, but I think that it is important for all of us to understand that these uh, these opportunities and resources, just like Veronica and Abby said, are out there. Um, and we have to support each other during these challenging times and during these uh, moments where Latinos are not thinking about retirement because they just can't. Um, so here, um, both in my professional capacity and personal capacity, to always learn from my community. These charlas are super important because you get to hear from others. And I think that listening is a huge part uh, of our growth and opportunity as well. So thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity to share this afternoon. Thank that, you, I, Tatiana, thank you. Thank you for sharing from your heart, from your truth. I really appreciate the story. I think we can all, I think it resonates with a lot of us, um, particularly those of us who, who do live you know, with our family or have family members who come and live with us. Um, and whether it's temporary or forever, you know, it does impact how we live and the choices that we have in front of us. So I appreciate you sharing and, um, uh, and we'll have you on for in case people have questions for you later. Uh, so uh, we're going to uh, welcome Armando Troll, Media Relations Manager with the National Council on Aging. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Armando, it's take it away. Thank you. It's very good to be here. And I uh, can certainly um, I can certainly sympathize, empathize with what Tatiana is saying, because I have part B of that charla which is preparing for retirement as you are caregiving. I'm a little older than some of the other folks that are here, so I'm a little closer to retirement. And as it happened a few years ago, I had to become the sole caregiver for my 98-year-old mother. And uh, when her husband passed away in Florida shortly after the hurricane. So I brought her to live with me, and I created a house here in Washington that was senior friendly. That was an investment, money that I thought I was going to invest for my retirement, but I had to invest it to make my house senior accessible from a ramp to bathrooms. And then the expense of having a caregiver that would take care of her because I am a single man. And, and so I had to have someone care for my mother. So a year into that process, I realized that it was unsustainable for me. I realized that I was not going to be able to keep the promise to my mother that she would not be placed in a nursing home and I couldn't live with that. I could not accept that I was gonna fail my mother uh, as a Latino, right? 
And, but then I realized that I couldn't work 50, 60 hours a week and then have almost $3,000 a month in expenses to care uh, for my mother. And then it, it became overwhelming. It became maddening. And then I had a eureka moment. I have a partner in Nicaragua. My fiance lives there. And I had a small apartment there. And I began looking at ways for my mother to live in Nicaragua. And I began researching hospitals, caregivers, nurses, and the cost of giving my mother an absolutely triple A life that I could not give her in Washington DC and that she was not gonna get in a retirement home. And so what I did was I got a much bigger house in one of the nicest neighborhoods in Nicaragua. My fiance lives there. I have a full-time nurse that works six days a week there. I have two additional people to help. And not only has my mother's health improved, but I've kept my mother safe from COVID. My mother is happy. My mother is totally, totally surrounded by people all the time, which is great for her. The weather has gotten rid of her arthritis issues. And up until COVID, I was visiting every month and spending a week there so that I was with my mother interacting with her. And now, as soon as I'm able to get a flight, I will be able to spend three or four months there because my job is allowing me to work remotely as long as I need to. So for me, and this is working for me, right? Doesn't mean it's working for everybody. But for me, this was my solution to keeping a promise to my mother to give her the best possible life that I could give her, surrounded by people who were caring for her, with four cameras in the house. So I see every minute of the day what is happening. And those people that work there answer to me. And my fiance is there to make sure that everything is happening the way it should be. This to me was a very important step. And it immediately took away this huge burden, this huge rock that all of us who are caregiving for our parents have about balancing what our needs are when I have 10 years before I retire to what I owe my mother to give her a good life. For me, this was very important. Uh, and luckily I'm also in the, in the economic strata that I could do this, right? There are a lot of people that this is, is not doable for them. Uh, but I think that you have to be creative in how you think and you have to not give up and do the best you can as I have done for my mother. And believe me, I had conversations with a lot of people who had gone through this. And, and when I spelled out that, oh, and by the way, the expense of keeping my mother in that triple A kind of life is half of what I was spending for just the caregiver. So the caregiver here was 3000 a month for $1,500 a month, I have a house in one of the nicest neighborhoods in Managua, three people to care for my mother. And the money that I invested for her is allowing me to pay for that and allowing me to have money for her other medical finances. So I have her needs totally covered. So I think that, the, and then of course, my own personal needs, right? My savings for my retirement, my sanity, that I can actually go to sleep and not worry about, you know, what happens to my mother. And of course, you know, as they, as your parents get older, they're gonna need more care. So you're not living in a static situation as your, as your, as your parents get older, they need more care. So my, my fear was if I can hardly make it now, if I'm barely treading water here in, in DC now, what happens? when she can't get up by herself, when she needs constant attention, how can I give my mother the quality of life that I owe her? And that was the solution that I came up with. So um, that is my personal story from the National Council on Aging. I would like to say that Tony asked who else besides AARP? Well, let me say the National Council on Aging also 
which has been around for 70 years. We're also a partner with Abigail. And one of the things that we do is we look out for the people that are the older adults that are on the lower socioeconomic scale, the people that maybe cannot invest, the people that are really a couple of catastrophic events from total economic failure. We have a, a tool called benefitscheckup.org, benefitscheckup.org, and it is a free uh, tool and any older adult who wants to figure out what kind of benefits they can access, additional social security, additional Medicare and Medicaid help, additional help to pay for uh, utilities, benefitscheckup.org is where they can go. They put in a few uh, uh, data points like their zip code, their age, and they're able to get a scroll down menu of all of the resources in their community, including centers where they can go and get additional help. And we are happy to say we will be rolling out a tool in Spanish very, very soon so that we can reach directly to that level of the population that is not at the estate planning level, that is not at the IRA level, that is not at the 401k level. Those are not the older adults that we work with. And unfortunately, within the Latino community, that is a much larger percentage of, of, of our population. And the last point that I will leave you is, this applies to you, young person that is listening to this. You're going to live a lot longer than uh, people were living. We are now living beyond our 80s. And that means that the structures that are now in place to give us a secure retirement are not sufficient. Communities are not sufficient. The infrastructure is not sufficient. So you need to start planning early because you will live into your 80s as your parents will, and you need to have a solid base. I thank you so much for this opportunity to share my story. Uh, thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Abigail. Thank you, Tony. And thank you, everyone else. Thank you, Armando. Thank you for the for your honesty and for for sharing that that uh, your your experience. Yeah, I I am 37, but my dad is 87. So uh, um, I have I have an older dad, and and my mom is 72, and and they're from Paraguay. And when when they think about wanting to move back there, um, it's so far away. But you know, comparatively, you know, you want to think about the choices that we have in front of us as we're aging to live the best life that we can as we age. And so I appreciate your sharing your story and um, and the long distance caregiving that you're providing to and the resources from National Council on Aging. Thank you so much. Um, so now we're going to hand it off to Juliana Mendez from California. She's a financial advisor, real estate investment advisor for my ECFO. Juliana, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts. And um, it's also my personal experience, like many of you, that sort of led me to this career. Um, you know, you have these pain points in life, and the next thing you know, you end up in these situations where you wish you knew all these, you know, all these things and you don't know, and you realize it and, and kind of um, realize that you're at a disadvantage. So um, I first wanted to start by sharing some thoughts on the changing paradigm of how we as Latinos think about retirement and how we invest in our retirement. And so over the last few decades, there's been sort of this big shift in, in perspectives and attitudes about retirement and how we invest in, within our community. So some of that has been as a result of, you know, going through the recession, the, the housing crisis. Um, and there's also this big increase in education, income, and wealth levels within our community. Um, uh, but on top of that, there's all these new opportunities and tools that are available to us with technology. I mean, we, you guys have been sharing a bunch here today. Um, so we have all this information available to us. And I myself am the daughter of, of Mexican immigrant farm workers. And so my parents came to this country with, without really any financial literacy. So retirement was something to them uh, was one thing. And, and I call it retirement 1.0. You know, you spend frugally, um, you know, my, my, it's peach season right now. My dad is a farm worker in California. So you better believe we're having, you know, peach cobbler and, and chopped up peaches with tahine for the rest of the summer. You know, you, you spend frugally um, and then hopefully maybe buy a house, pay it off and, and sort of own something that, you know, can't be taken away. Um, so paying off the home sort of becomes the, the focus and the priority of the retirement. And then um, some of you mentioned that the kids become the retirement. So it's kind of a, a crazy thing to, to understand that you are the retirement for your parents. And, um, you know, that once you sort of start um, having the, all these realizations, then you also kind of look to your parents. And when I would ask my parents about um, what their retirement plan was, it's, 
they would say, oh, well, social security or my home, you know? And so I know Abigail mentioned and talked a little bit about social security as well. Uh, but then there's also this other piece where we're, we're shifting away from a generation that relied heavily on uh, defined retirement benefits. So they can kind of, put, they could kind of put it on autopilot sometimes and just kind of let it be. And we're not in, in, in that environment anymore. Nowadays, there's even a risk and a fear that social security is threatened, right? So um, we are in a place now where we have to take charge of our own futures and our own retirement and become educated on it. So now what I like to call it is Latino Retirement 2.0. We have access to all of these new opportunities, all of this information, tools, and now we have the, the choice of how we want to invest in our retirement and protect our future. So we have these things like Roth IRAs, 401ks, 457 plans, brokerage accounts. I mean, all these things that um, you know, are, are tools for us that we can use. And so there's more of a realization that we have these diversified sort of um, opportunities to, to, uh, to diversify our investment and take charge of our own future and our own retirement. So the challenge is that even though we have all these things, we don't really know how to manage or, um, you know, kind of handle a retirement account because a lot of us didn't grow up with one, or maybe we just, our parents didn't know how to guide us on that. And now with COVID, I mean, our communities are being hit so hard and there's so many, so much uncertainty, so many questions. And so it's, it's not something you learn in school, right? So you have to kind of turn to organizations I mean, webinars and, and um, you know, events like right now where you learn about everything that you possibly can from people that are willing to share. And there's so much information out there nowadays that you really have to be proactive about it. Um, so I just wanted to share a few quick takeaways. And the first one is that you really have to become an active participant in your retirement. A lot of us will get our first job out of college and they'll offer us our first retirement plan. We get so excited. We just kind of sign everything and, and let it go. But there's, you know, this, you shouldn't rely on your employer to educate you about retirement. And a lot of us do, I, I did at one point, but to them, it's just, they're just checking off a box, right? So you will always be your own biggest advocate. So you want to understand and maximize all of your benefits at any job you have. Um, and the second thing is just to diversify and explore the non-traditional retirement options. Um, as I mentioned, you can't just rely on, you know, a social security income or a savings account, right? You have to explore and really um, dig, dig in the information to, to find out about new ways that you can diversify your investments. There's ways outside of the employer to invest. So you want to learn about those and have different buckets for yourself. Find someone you trust, a, a mentor, a friend, organizations like um, we have here today um, representing all of these uh, different groups and sharing a lot of information. There's so much free online material. My firm does free uh, webinars all the time and we have articles on our website and there are many out there. So I encourage you to really you know, get out there and learn as much as you can about it, especially while you're young. Um, there's also this stigma with wanting to hire service providers. We all think, oh, well, I can do it on my own. And, and I just, you know, hope that, you know, that it's okay to ask for guidance and help when you're ready from a professional. Um, and then just lastly about 401ks, I just want to mention, it's important to invest and pick the right products and, and maximize your contributions if you can, understand the tax, tax benefits. And one important and often overlooked piece is, um, the exit strategy. So back in the day, people used to stay in jobs for 10 or 15 years. Nowadays, it's like two, three, four years. So think about how many retirement plans, if you work for an employer that offers it, how many will you have by the time you retire? So you want to figure out how to transfer, how to consolidate when possible, um, no matter what kind of employer you find yourself in. And I have a little bit more, but I'm going to stop because it's already past my five minutes and I will turn it over to Orly. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. And I think we're going to actually go to, um, we're actually going to go to Ernie G uh, in California next. Um, but I think I definitely have questions for you. So I think we're going to come back to some questions for you, Juliana, uh, when, when we get to the Q&A section. So, um, so Ernie, take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ernie G. I'm an inspirational empowerment comedian. I've been doing comedy for over 20 years and I was the national spokesperson for the Hispanic College Fund, which is where I met uh, Antonio Tejerino many, many years ago. So I literally have inspired and empowered hundreds of thousands of college and high school students. I currently lead a Zoom at noon for teenagers every Monday and Friday. And so I was like, bro, why did you want me to talk about retirement, dude? I, I inspire hundreds of thousands of teenagers. And he said, because you were really public about moving your mother into an assisted living facility uh, just recently. And, I, and I, I did, and I was like, wow, I learned a lot about having my mom go from the house that she lived in for the past 30 years 
uh, and transitioning her into an assisted living facility. As I go across the country and inspire all these young people, I'm having to then deal with my mom. And so it was really, really uh, emotionally uh, trying for me. And I, 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 the one thing I really wanna share with everybody is that all of the rules that we grew up believing and thinking, you know, I know people were talking about the cultural uh, stigma of putting our parents in an assisted living facility or in retirement homes, but it ended up being the best thing that I ever did for my mother. And uh, last year she got sick uh, while I was performing in Washington, DC. She uh, got a bad UTI and was not able to get out of her bed. The other stigma that Latinos never want to talk about is how many of our parents are hoarders. My mom never threw anything away ever. She had stacks of Women's Day magazines from 1972. And I said, Mom, why do you have those magazines? She goes, I'm gonna collect, I'm gonna cut out the I'm gonna cut out the recipes and put them in one of those file cabinets. She had 12 file cabinets that had magazines for days. And so um, when it was when my mom couldn't get up out of bed, the ambulance came and got her, and it took them an hour to get my mom out of her apartment because or out of her house, and uh, because she had so much stuff and. Um, Hoarding is something that every Latino family, I believe, deals with on some level. Um, there's always, don't go into that room. Don't go, the house looks cute, but don't go into that bedroom. Don't go into the garage. And uh, it was just really emotionally trying for me because I had to hire a company while my mother was recuperating in the hospital. Uh, I had to call 1-800-GOT-JUNK and I spent $3,000. It took eight men, eight hours to get everything out of my mom's uh, house. And I talked to several psychologists and to several people that had dealt with it, hoarding experts. And they had, they said, have your mom write a list of the top 20 things that she must have that she can't be without. So I went and I got all of my old pictures and birth certificates and, and all that stuff. But the point I'm trying to make is that we threw a lot of my mom's uh, precious things away and she was devastated. And then we moved her into a an assisted living facility where she got three meals a day. She got to play bingo. She got to meet friends. And my mom had never been happier. Even though she won't admit that to anybody, she had never been happier. And then she was there for a year in this assisted living facility. And then 10 people got COVID at that facility. So then I was confronted with how do I get her out of there and into, do I move her into another facility? Do I move her into like a senora's house that I could pay the senora to take care of her? And I posted on Facebook, can anybody help me? And uh, the, the message that I'm trying to deliver here today is that when it comes to taking care of our parents, there is no shame in anybody's game. Like you, we must do whatever it takes to take care of our moms and our families. And I literally interviewed 20 different people. I went to go visit 20 different spots. I didn't want to move my mom into another assisted living facility. Um, so I found an independent living facility. Uh, assisted living facilities mean that nurses come in and out and they visit different facilities. So it's pretty, uh, we can rest assured that one of the nurses probably brought COVID into my mom's assisted living facility. So I moved her into a, an independent living facility. Uh, where they have way less nurses coming in and out of there. And now my mom is living in an independent living facility where she gets fed, she gets taken care of. And the, the, the point I want to make, and I try to speak about this with everybody everywhere I go, is that we're all professionals. We all do what we do, but nobody wants to talk about the truth about how our how we are dealing with our families. And I've been very transparent and very uh, authentic about my experience. And it literally inspired a lot of different people, including, I guess, Antonio Tejerino, uh, because I had people calling me. And now I'm like this expert on assisted living facilities, nursing care. And I found out there's all different kinds of levels of care. There's all different 
there, there are people out there, um, these agents, these uh, um, senior living agents, and they're there supposedly to support you in finding a place for your family or, 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 your, or your loved ones. But really they get a big fat commission by placing you in certain homes. So if you're talking to a professional, I would recommend that you talk to several different professionals and get several different places to go and you gotta do your due diligence. And I, I'm very proud of the fact that I did, I worked my butt off for my mama and I went to visit all kinds of places. I spoke to all kinds of different people and I found people that weren't as interested in a commission as much as they were interested in making sure my mom had everything that she needed. So my mom is cleaner than she's ever been. She's healthier than she's ever been. She's in a facility that really cares about her, ran by an amazing Puerto Rican woman named Coco who said, I'm gonna treat your mama like my mama. And that was the selling point for me when I can tell that people really cared about my mother. And so the message that I deliver everywhere I go to hundreds of thousands of students I've had hundreds of thousands of students repeat the phrase, if it is to be, it is up to me. And as professionals, we often think, yeah, yeah, I got that motivational piece covered. Now let me go do my homework and, and do my due diligence. But sometimes just admitting that some, our parents hoard, our parents need help, and I need help, sometimes being willing to be that transparent a flood of resources and a flood of love and people come to our aid and so many people came to my aid and I'm proud to say that my mom is no longer in an assisted living facility where 10 people got COVID. She's now in an independent living facility where she gets to come and go as she pleases and zero people have COVID there and Ernie G did that for his mama. And as far as hoarding is concerned, I started writing a whole new piece of material about it because every time I was like, hey, dude, have you ever heard of hoarding? My friends, like, oh my God, my grandmother is a hoarder. My tia is a hoarder. And so I'm writing a one man show about that because we got to get it out from under the closet and out so that people can support each other and love each other. Um, and so stay strong, everybody out there. I, I, I think all of the amazing people on this call, on this charla, um, are providing some amazing resources and some amazing uh, wherewithal to take care of our parents. But I think the most important thing is to have the fortitude to be able to say, I need help. How can I really take care of my mom? And uh, Ernie G did his due diligence. Uh, and I always like leaving uh, every, every person I ever speak to, every student I ever empower, I always like leaving with this. So I'll leave you guys with this. I just got asked to do my second TED talk. I did a TED talk in uh, December in Orlando. I did my second TED talk uh, in February. And so I always leave everybody that I ever empower or inspire with this uh, quote. And it says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It's our light, not our darkness, which most frightens us. Our parents are the most important thing on the planet. And knowing that my mama is safe makes me prouder than anything I've ever done in my life. My mama is happy, she's healthy, she's safe. So please continue to let your light shine and thank you for letting me let my light shine, you guys. Mucho gusto. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ernie. I would stand up, but you guys would get a weird angle. And uh, so I just appreciate so much about what you have to say. I am uh, actually, you know, sometimes I make the choice not to address the hoarding with my own parents because the time that I have with them, I want it to be stress free and I want us to get along. It's such a triggering and traumatic thing. Um, there's pain that comes out of that. There's pain, real pain that comes out of having to let go of the material things. And I think that, you know, we, what I've seen is that out of pain comes this gold comedy too, right? So <laughs> I'm so happy that you are able to channel it this way. Add me to the list of the hundreds of thousands of people you've inspired. Zoom at noon, right? Um, we're gonna, we're gonna remember to check that out. So thank you so much for being here with us, Ernie. I've got chills from your, from your talk. So thank you. Mucho gusto. Gracias. Gracias yeah. a todos. So next we're going to Orly Pacheco in New York. She's the head of the Wealth Management, AR, ARS Capital Advisors. So take it away, Orly. Well, great. Thank you so much. My name is Orly, and uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Just give me a thumbs up. 
like some type of social interaction. That's great. I know the wave will be at the end. I promise you, we'll get that through. My name is Orly. Both my parents are born in Ecuador. I'm obviously first generation. And I'm born in a very, very foreign land called Brooklyn, New York, you know, which is in the greatest city in the world. Afterwards, you can discuss about what city is better. Uh, also, peacefully, please, we don't have to go into arguments about who city is better. But um, I'll, I'll go into this quick story about how it, this, this email, this call to action really, really touched me. A couple of weeks ago, I was contacted by Gary Stein. Gary Stein's a reporter who was creating a piece for registered investment advisors, financial advisors, RIAs, uh, people like in my world, you know, this is banter, the banter conversation, you know, it's like the, uh, the insider's world. And the piece was titled, The Most Overlooked Clients in Wealth Management. Long ignored, Latinos offer a huge untapped opportunity. And I, the first thing was like, Gary, what are you, what are you talking about? The two parties is a capitalistic move. And I'm like, really, for the purpose of this piece, um, and as him and I, and I was giving my thoughts, on, it made me really reflect on a true North moment in my personal life, which is why I came into wealth management. You know, I called my Charla, as you see here, probably a letter from the field. Man. Uh, my parents were born from Ecuador, both from that type of background. Uh, they came from immigrants, right? They had what they had on their back, they bought what they had, and they, they made it happen. I was very fortunate. You know, my mother broke her back cleaning toilets in people's apartments here in New York City. Um, and my father was a little bit of the more interesting one, I call him, when it came to a career and what he did when he grew up. Um, having only an element, um, he really, really took on a whole nother piece. My, mind you, my mother was very educated, bachelor's degree back in Ecuador and all these different types of accolades. But having only an elementary degree, he was a painter in New York City, but not the ones you see at Home Depot or in front of stores like, you know, today they're known Jornaledos and all across the different places, but he's a part of the million dollar firm. Mind you, an immigrant, first to come, nothing on his back, only with what he had, but he made it, made it a great impact to succeed. And he was Latino, he was from Ecuador, yeah. So known as Pacheco the painter, he made a name for himself and much more I came to find out he was like a legend and people like, your, I remember your father, he, I, he heard he passed away. My condolence is like, yeah, he did. Thank you. Um, I didn't realize that people had that much admiration for him. See, when I was young, I'd go to work for them. And I remember the usual stores, like I said, home people and other places like that, uh, that, that people normally think about when they think about uh, contractors. And, you know, he would give people chances, people ask him for work, all this type of stuff. But it stands really high because if you could imagine his clients were high-end clients, they expected the best. But let's fast forward just a little bit now. My dad was in his 70s, okay? He was diagnosed with dementia. As I heard other few folks as well on this chart today, uh, their folks, older folks, were also diagnosed with different things. And, you know, it's hard to take care of elder parents, you know? Um, I, was, I was in Iraq at the time, 2005, with the Marines. And the first thing I asked was my mother, mom, what's going on? What's the plan look like? Is everything in good order? She says, of course, Mio, we're good, we're fine. Don't stress it, do your life, do what you have to do. Okay, mom? I trust you, you know, later years would pass and it would come out to be that my father, you know, what's up with my dad, my dad's stuff. Where, where, where are we, mom? Uh, it came to be that things were not in order. When you think about it carefully, I was a financial service executive. So my previous life was on wall street itself, working every single day on a different side, the broker dealer side, traveling internationally to visit other banks and international different uh, type of uh, my counterparts were like the heads of businesses, CEOs, et cetera. Um, and go figure, I'm the one that's working in the space. I understand money inside out. I have a degree in it, not just that, but also two advanced degrees in it. Yet though, I came to fail at my family, you know? And I feel like it at that moment, but there was nothing there. The picture was blank, imagine it. Social security had put a lien on the estate to recoup on over a decade of nursing home expenses. He had no life insurance to leave assets behind. People who said that before, taking care of themselves by buying life insurance, you buy that with love. Always remember that. You buy life insurance when you're alive and healthy with love. Um, you know, he left no assets to my mother. He left no assets to the children. He had no 401k. And this great partnership that he had as a company, a multi-million dollar firm in his retirement went completely belly up. So that was dead in the water as well. Imagine there was nothing there. Again, I'm a Wall Street guy, very strong pension, very strong income, very, very strong knowledge. Oh, there was nothing there. Imagine a coveted role, 
all three type of things. But yet, though, how, how did things fall apart? I realized the way that my calling wasn't working with CEOs, market dealers, and other foreign dignitaries. It was to be back at home. The custodial bank had me as I had them, but I had a calling outside of it. And that was to be back in wealth management. See, I share the common goals of people. I share and I learn that this role is about trust. I sit in a seat every single day that like in this article I was quoted in, Orly, what's wrong with Latinos? No, what's wrong with people who don't know how to get to us? They can't relate, you know? When you think about it, 61 million Latinos in the United States, according to Pew Research, you know, the biggest issue that I see is not the Latinos. They're making money, they're working, they're out, they're out there. You know, there's, there's people who make money every single day, but it's the true necessity for competent. And I take it from the, the side again, remember my letter to, from wealth management to the people here. Remember, this is about competent, ethical, certified financial planners who need to understand culture, perspective, and really what it means to be Latino. A good friend, the media commentator, Lily Hill, says the following, and her and I had this discussion about it less than a year ago at a convention we were both speaking at. And she goes, Worley, the companies have tremendous, tremendous buying power and monetary resources, but data shows, remember data, not just here, say data, data shows we're not prepared for retirement, not one bit, not whatsoever. Got an uphill battle, really. I was like, thanks, Lily, that's, that's about it. So outside of my daily operation, what I do running a people that nearly manage $250 million in assets, I take the burdens of traveling on behalf of organizations. One of them is definitely alpha. As the midnight oil, I call it, burns, sometimes on a plane in the middle of the night, first thing in the morning to fly to visit different chapters because there we build leaders. And I'm very, very proud to be with that organization for the last 15 years, as much as well as with you guys here. It's also an honor to do so. Now, as I'm getting close to sign off on my letter here, I look at each portion of the discussion today. It's extremely vital. You need to be part of it. You need to be on top of it. But also, I will also say, for those that are considering a career in financial services, do it, okay? We need you. Uh, increasing the numbers, and this is the way I think about it, by increasing the numbers of planners, not just in the stand, but come from the communities that we work and live in, will help increase a positive return, not just investments, but back in the communities that we can come from. Through our work, especially here in organizations like this one, like Alpha, like the Financial Planning Association, you know, another one that I spend a lot of time with, we're working on learning the commitment to embrace, embrace change, but most of all to create ripple effects in literacy and financial literacy as a whole. Because imagine if our parents came to this country with nothing, they knew very little to be able to make it. Yet though today we are at a step above them because they put their backs down until they could step on top. They did it with great pride. Right. And now it's our turn to step up and also do that. So I'll just leave you with some quick numbers and we'll make this thing happen. There's currently about 85,000 certified financial planners in the United States. Only 3.8% of them are diverse. We have a lot of work ahead of us. So Antonio, Brenda, Teresa, Jasmine, thank you for bringing us together today. The community definitely needs these type of conversations, making sure that we are at the forefront of them you know, about retirement planning and how that's coming to life. Because retirement plans are like water, they always move their fluid. You know, to all the participants today, thank you so much for your insight. Thank you so much for what you provide because these stories are real. And the stories from our communities that really make a difference. And lastly, again, as I sign off on my little letter to you guys from the wealth management space. My name is Orly, a wealth management specializes in retirement planning and a committed, a committed member, I'm sorry about that, in the community. Many, many years of philanthropy, 15 plus, to give back to our community to get here where I am at today. I not just work hard for myself, I work hard for my kids, and I work hard for my family. And I really, really enjoy doing what I do. I'm glad I left corporate, but I'm also extremely proud to be able to work with folks just like yourselves. So anything that we Thank can do you. to better serve you, please let us know. Thank you, Orly, and thank you so much for your service as well. We're gonna go over to Claudia Rivas. Uh, she's a board member for Hispanic Heritage Foundation. So thank you so much for being here with us, Claudia. I'm going to let you take it away. Hi, everyone. And thank you, Antonio, and everybody else who uh, helped put this together. Uh, I thought at first that my story would be a little bit unique, but it sounds like I, I think a lot of us are dealing with very similar things. Um, I wanted to uh, just provide my own story of 
kind of a data point to hopefully help inspire other people that uh, may find any type of association with my story as a good uh, point to hopefully create wealth. Uh, when I think about wealth and retirement, I think a lot of us think about it's a longer term, but obviously it's something that uh, we got to start thinking about now. Uh, my own story is that I was born in El Salvador and I came to San Francisco when I was 10 months old. My grandmother was a uh, worked in the laundry department at a hotel. And uh, then my mom quickly remarried when I was about a year and a half to my stepfather, who's from Mexico. So I had a wonderful opportunity to have uh, both live in both places. Uh, then in high school, I moved to Mexico and ended up getting pregnant at 16. And so um, luckily I was able to come back to the US. Uh, my son is now 20 years old and I have another kid who's eight, I'm married. Um, and at the age of 16, when I was a single mom, um, it was because I was trying to run away from home and I felt that was my only way out. Uh, luckily, my grandmother had done a lot of the hard work. And so um, I enrolled, I've been really lucky. I enrolled in college, I studied economics, and then I got my MBA. And uh, then quickly through mentorship, uh, went into work for a Wall Street company um, and rose up now to be one of the top 4% women, 1% of the Latinas that arguably one of the most cutthroat industries. Uh, the people that I serve are usually wealthy, some of the wealthiest Latinx people and other people of color in the US, uh, entrepreneurs, lawyers, techies being here in Silicon Valley. And I wanted to kind of go on to my journey about how I've created my own wealth as I think about my mother who uh, works at Walmart and we're one of five kids and she's actually now a single mom, has been a single mom for the past 15 years. So to some people's point about how uh, we're thinking about not only ourselves, but you know, when I have conversations with my sisters, I'm talking to them about how we have to start putting aside some cash for my mom's emergency. Uh, right now, her uh, company, uh, was shut down because of the riots and we decided that uh, and she had uh, some health problems so we have her on disability and we we're thinking about what to do there. Uh, so so these are some of the my own personal things that I'm going through and uh, so I wanted to share some of the uh, stories of kind of how I've how I've navigated building my own wealth and how I think about it so hopefully some people can, uh, maybe ask me whatever questions you want about how to go through this. But I think one of the most important things to think about is how we view wealth as a lot of next people. And I think when I work with different communities of color, it's allowed me to really realize how our own perspective in terms of culture leads us to significant wealth or not, meaning <clears throat> our thoughts, our upbringing, our culture are just some of the factors that affect how we live our lives. And so we have to understand what our upbringing. <clears throat> and to understand ourselves, we really have to think about the economic history of where we come from, but also the economic history of our own families. Um, usually we come from um, uh, cultures that were taught to be humble and work hard. Um, and unfortunately, the being humble is not uh, necessarily one thing that serves that well in, in corporate America, but I believe that the right uh, balance to that is to be uh, humble and assertive. I don't think you should ever forget that. Um, and so right now that we're going through really difficult times, I think of myself when I was poor, and I, I remember thinking, you know, going to the library at that time. Now there's like so many digital resources that you can tap into. Uh, and, and not only that, but also surrounding myself who with people who are supporting me without judgment. And I'd write myself little notes about how I can achieve success. And I think that's an important journey of what we have to do. You have to put in the work as other speakers have said. 
And you have to have faith in something that doesn't even believe, you know, that you don't believe might happen. And I still even have some of the stuff that I, that I wrote from back then. Um, the other thing that I think is important is that we have to really think about radical changes in our own culture and how uh, that's going to affect what we're doing going forward. So in some cases, you know, if you're thinking about creating a new mindset of, of like not spending and, you know, being a little bit more gold or as, as they would say, um, some people may not support you. And I think you have to really surround yourself with people that are that are really your cheerleaders because it's 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 not an easy journey. Um, I know that as the oldest daughter and when I wanted to go to college, believe it or not, even in my own family, they said that I was being selfish because I wasn't working to sustain my family and I also had my own kid. And so at that time I had to make a very difficult decision to avoid my family in that in that near term. Uh, and, and very difficult, but you know, in the end it worked out well. Everybody's really proud. So I think in terms of another radical change is just thinking about entrepreneurship, um, continuing to attain uh, corporate mobility, uh, moving far away from family to seek opportunities, go to school, uh, go into fields that are gonna be the future, such as technology. Um, and, and I think in particular to women, it's gonna be important that we're making decisions as well about our own, uh, what to do with our own bodies, whether we wanna have kids or not, whether we wanna get married or not, because that does influence our potential impact of, of earnings in the future. Uh, another thing that I wanted to talk about was kind of think about uh, your own first role models. And I think when we think of our first role models, usually it comes to mind that it's our parents. And uh, sometimes when we, when I talk to other kids of like, oh, what are your parents saying about money? Uh, they're like, pues que no hay dinero. And believe it or not, that's actually very, uh, very negative. And it, it, instead of thinking like, pues no hay dinero, but like there's no money, like what can we do to actually afford it and have a plan? is probably a better way of articulating things that we wanna get done um, because it, it, it moves you out of that limited thinking and scarcity. Um, and at the same time, this sense of family and humility is what makes our culture great. And it's what make, and I think we have to always remember to have that uh, in us and never forget where we come from. And uh, so it's gonna be really important to think about who you hang out with uh, when you are really changing your financial mentality, because uh, you have to be conscious, are they spending more than me? Am I not spending as much? So you're going to have to make some sacrifices. And I think, you know, having my own 20 year old son in terms of wants and needs uh, and guiding him and thinking more differently about his future are, are very challenging, but I think it's, it's what's going to be needed to continue to create wealth. Um, and, um, the other thing is, uh, again, going back to the, the, the situation that we're in is reframing any situation that we have. Um, I personally grew up in a very volatile environment. And uh, I believe that I, even though I didn't have financial wealth at the time, that I had a lot to offer and grit and hustle and uh, this uh, curiosity to always learn. And that is a form of wealth. So even though you don't feel like you're there yet, um, just feel rich because we are such an amazing culture. In fact, I always joke, I'm like, every day I'm so thankful I'm Latina because <laughs> I think we do, we do have a lot of really wonderful characteristics that perhaps other people don't necessarily share. Uh, and then one uh, last thing is, um, I think a couple more things is how we could be our own worst enemies. Like, for example, when they say, Tu quien te crees? Who do you think you are? Um, have you ever asked yourself in a loving, non judgmental way um, how to be better and love yourself unconditionally? And so, what I want to say is basically, you have to almost brainwash yourself in talking about how to be the most loving person. And then also, that'll initially create like, and it sounds silly, but you know, and all the wealthiest people that I've spoken to and that I work with, it's these little things of uh, money comes easily to me. I love myself. I'm special. 
and most important, at least for me, that I came from a very volatile place was I'm safe. And um, I think those are important things. And then one last thing is that uh, we have an, uh, I've read somewhere, we have an average of 60,000 thoughts per day. And so in order to, for you to really change and create wealth, you have to look at what you're saying to yourself. And you have to train yourself instead of saying like, ay, que tonto soy, or que tonta, uh, I can never do this, or I can't have it all. I think it's extremely important to catch yourself so you can really start transforming yourself to believe that you can attain what you want to do. And I 100% promise that your doors are going to open to a healthier and wealthier you. And that's it. Thank you so much, Claudia. That was so powerful and so vulnerable of you. There's power in that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I just, everything you said, 100,000%. <laughs> Um, I recently read an article on parents.com um, with some advice about things never to say to our kids. And one of the things was we can't afford that and changing the way you talk about it um, in terms of having a plan, sitting down, thinking, you know, what is important to us and what are we able to, uh, you know, if we want that, what can we go do so that we can go out there and get that and make that happen for ourselves. So yeah. for sure, you know, it's not other people that get in our way. It's what we say to ourselves that gets in our way. So uh, really, really appreciate yeah. what you what you have to share with us. Um, so we have three more speakers today. And what's going to end up happening is we're going to actually cut the Q&A. Um, so my friends at Hispanic Heritage Foundation have promised that we'll share links with the group in case anybody was wondering, you know, any of the resources we mentioned, we're going to be sharing that with the audience. Um, so next, uh, we're going to have Mary Gonzalez of Silver Spring, my neighbor. Uh, I'm in White Flint. Uh, we're going to have, um, have Mary. So go ahead, Mary. Mute. So I may be the only, OK, wait, is it working? You were just there, Mary. Yeah, there you are. Go ahead. So I may be the only retired person on this, Sharla, but um, I never wanted to retire so young, but it is possible. And what I wanted to convey to this group is um, going through the social security um, system is crazy. It's awful, but I am open. I have shared all my um, all of my um, uh, personal chats, or personal stuff with everybody. But I think for us as a community, it's just crazy because so many times um, it is crazy that Retirement is just um, well, Social Security, the Social Security system is really awful. And so I'd certainly open it up to helping anybody. And I never expected to retire this early, but now that I am, it's, I definitely want to help people because it is a ridiculous um, administrative nightmare. I came to, D to DC in the 90s to serve as um, counsel for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. And I've had so many wonderful things in my life. But it's so interesting that the government, and for me, I'm third generation Mexican American. And it is ridiculous that 
there are so many nets that you have to jump through and it cost me a lot of money and it was crazy. But if I can help anybody who's listening on this chat, it sounds like everybody is more dealing with their parents. But for me, um, it's more about how to um, deal with the system and get through. And I was first generation college student, went to law school, all that. Um, and after almost 20 years of community service, I worked in police misconduct oversight. I worked on many different things. It's just crazy how Social Security can be so awful. So I thank you, Hispanic Heritage Foundation and AARP. And I realize I probably need to be more involved with advocacy for that. Thank you, Mary. We, we, we'll definitely be reaching out to you. And I really appreciate you sharing with us today. I hope that um, we can stay connected and, uh, and Hispanic Heritage Foundation can, can keep us connected too, so that we can share if you want to be more involved in, in advocacy and sharing your story. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's just so awful. Um, but it is possible for people to retire on disability. It's okay. also like terrible. Okay. Thank you for your honesty. I, um, I think we're going to go to our next panelist, uh, Jason Ramirez. Thank you so much, Mary. Hi. So um, thank you all the panelists today who are here and sharing your stories. It's given me and a lot of other people here some perspective on retirement, as well as other things in life. So my name is Jason Ramirez. I'm a student at the University of Maryland College Park, and I'm getting to graduate next semester. So go Terps. Hey. Uh, I'm also one of the people that Ernie G inspired 10 years ago, and I never thought I'd be on the same panel as him on retirement. Um, so they were here, we're here today. It's 2020. So growing up, I've lived my life through improvisation and going with the flow. Uh, I've always had the presumption that things don't always go according to plan. So we don't really have to like go through plans anyway. And so far it's worked in my favor. I've, I've started making more plans, but for the most part, just improvising as I go along. So uh, it makes sense because that's the way I was raised by my parents. So one day I decided to ask my parents what their plans were for retirement. And imagine my surprise when they told me that they had nothing saved. So I always expected to take care of them once they got old. Um, it's what Juliana said, um, I am, Oh, when you think like the kids are the retirement for your for your parents, you know? So like, I, I always kind of knew I was gonna be retirement for my parents. I didn't know it was gonna be like at a disadvantage. So I want my parents to live a comfortable retirement because if anyone deserves it, it's them. They sacrificed so much for me, my sister, our families, and extended families, and all the people along the way. And I just wanna make sure they live a comfortable life after they retire. So the title of this presentation is to get comfortable speaking about family finances. So uh, this is going to directly speak to parents, both to parents and also to children of parents. So to parents, I want you to implore, I want to implore you to speak to your children about your retirement plans and your, and your finances, especially if you don't have a retirement plan. Your children want to help you and these conversations will help them know how they can help you. It's because whether you know it or not, your decision, um, on your retirement plans could have a financial impact on future generations of your family. So we want the intergenerational wealth to happen, uh, not just for our family, but also for our community, you know, also for the Latinx community. We, we want to make sure we're, we're be they're better off than we are. So, and also for the children of parents, uh, I want you to ask your parents what their retirement plans are. We know it's an uncomfortable um, conversation, but it's a necessary conversation. You will want to know ahead of time how you'll be supporting your parents when the time comes. So one tip I have on this, on how to approach this, is to come from a place of love. Um, 
as Abigail said. So tell your parents that you love them and you want to know about their plans in case they need help in the future. Your goal is to understand their wishes and resources and to not take control and explain that you're there to help and acknowledge that the subject is sensitive. So that's all I have today. I believe in short speeches. Thank you everyone for having me here. Thank you, Jason and go Terps. Uh, we're <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, okay, so we're gonna go to our final and last but not least speaker, Emmanuel Pleites, chairman and uh, co-founder of Hispanic Heritage Foundation. De definitely not the co-founder, but chairman of Hispanic Heritage Foundation um, and co-founder of Islos Capital. Oh, co-founder of Islos. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah no, no worries. <laughs> all, all good. It's, 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 been a, it's been a long day um, and a long week for all of us. Uh, so anyway, I, I will try to be brief um, because a lot of content was already covered. And um, I, what, what I'll do is give you some rules of thumb. And maybe I'll start with explaining some of my background um, credentials, so to speak. Uh, so, so I started my career on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs, actually as a financial advisor. So I kind of, that's where I got my initial training. But over time, I have, my own career has has gone in, in a few different directions. But um, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm an investor, right? So I actually look at individual companies, individual securities or companies, and make a decision on whether or not uh, my, uh, the people that give me capital to manage it on their behalf, whether or not that individual investment is a good investment or, or not. Uh, and so um, so I understand how to analyze things on the individual company level, uh, but, I, but I came from a training of understanding portfolio allocation. And so while a lot of the, the talks have actually been on, on some of the very real issues that, that you and, and your families face, especially on the expense side and in the bureaucratic side, uh, especially Social Security, but also understanding things like, uh, you know, where do you put your parents or grandparents um, and how do you manage those expenses and, and how do you have to plan for that? Uh, for, for my end, I'll start with some rules of thumb uh, and, and essentially go uh, that, that at any age you should be applying. Uh, number one is if you have any debt, pay down the highest interest rate first, right? Once you start paying down the highest interest rate, then you start getting down to lower interest rate debt. And at some point, you hit a, you hit a point where maybe it's like a low interest rate student loan. And at that point, that's when you should consider, well, I shouldn't just have cash sitting in my bank account or underneath my mattress. I should be putting it to work. I should be investing it for the long run. And what you first want to do is if you have an employer that offers uh, 401k or some kind of retirement account, uh, you always want to max those out first, right? So um, it helps that, especially when some employers either match the amount or add on top of whatever you put in, you want to start maxing, uh, maximizing those. Then after that, um, and, and I don't want to get into exactly how you do it. I'll, I'm going to about to hit on that in a second. And after that, um, I, while I've not always been a believer in life insurance, it is something to consider, especially for rainy days. I personally did not have life insurance for a while, and now I do, and I got it through uh, my serving in the military. Uh, but as I've learned more into, looked more into it, especially for bad scenarios, having that life insurance policy doesn't hurt. Now, I don't want to sit here and tell you which life insurance you should get because it, there's hundreds of products out there. What I will tell you is that if you're being sold life insurance for the first time, uh, say thank you and go talk to someone else because you want to see all your options on the table. Uh, and here's some rules of thumb. Uh, usually, if you're the majority of people sh could consider term life insurance. And as you get up in income and you start thinking about taxes and the impact that has on your income for the long run, then you start thinking about whole life insurance and annuities. Again, rules of thumb, we, we can talk offline, you can contact me later if you wanna get into those, situ those, those details. Now, you did that, you maxed out your retirement accounts, you did your life insurance, um, if you're interested in, and wanna have plan for a rainy day. Uh, but, uh, and, and life insurance is not just about a death benefit, that when I mentioned uh, annuities and there's sort of other ways to have tax uh, advantageous ways of, for you to manage your money. Now, you have more money left over. Right? So for a lot of us lucky ones that have that situation, now you want to be thinking, how do you invest that? Uh, the rule of thumb that usually financial advisors in the past utilized was that whatever your age is, you take 100 minus your age. So say you're aged 50, you take 100 minus your age. So what's remained, the remainder is 50. So you put that much amount in stocks. 
right? So if you're age 20, you take 100 minus 20, you have 80% left over, you put 80% in stocks and the rest you put in bonds. Now that's the old rule of thumb. As we live longer, that formula now says, instead of you starting with 100, start at like 120. And so if you start at 120 and you're 50, 120 minus 50 equals 70. So you put 70% in stocks. This is not, you should still seek a financial advisor for help, uh, but this is effectively a rough rule of thumb of how you want to think about investing. And if you want to do it by yourself, it's not bad to use this. Then you can start figuring out what you put your money into. Now, when people say, well, what do I do? What are stocks and what are bonds? Here's roughly bonds. If you look at bonds, there are, so, there are things called all market or aggregate market or total bond ETFs. An ETF is essentially something that monitors the market, monitors a, a, an index fund. And so you can use those. So if, so if you see that, all bond, total market, aggregate, that basically is saying you're, you're, you're buying a bunch of bonds. So that's one way to do the bond side. If you want to do the equity side, the two most common indices are the S&P 500 and the Russell 3000. The S&P 500 is the 500 largest companies in the U.S., and, and one thing that most people don't realize is that of those 500 largest companies in the US, usually 40 to 50% of their revenue is actually driven from outside the US. So you're effectively investing around the world. Most people don't realize that. So S&P 500, you're effectively investing around the world. Now, if you really wanted like, well, no, I, I want more, more than 500, then the Russell 3000 is basically investing in 98% of all US companies. And again, you use that kind of rough number out of the 3000 US companies, probably 35, 40% of that is around the world. So anyway, those are some rough numbers. So, you know, 120 minus your age and then stocks by S&P 500, Russell 3000, bonds by aggregate or total bond market ETFs. And if you want, I can tell you more about that, but those are some uh, rules of thumb for you as an investor. Um, and that's without getting too much into analysis, that's how the big institutions, the pension funds, the insurance companies, the big corporations, your, your college endowment, they all do roughly something like that. And if you do it on your own, you're essentially saving on, you know, 2% that usually managers like, like me get uh, to do it on your behalf. <laughs> so I'll stop there uh, in case there are any questions or otherwise we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day. But um, I, I like to bring things down to a level where anyone can understand them because investing is not rocket science, but it's something you should be doing. Uh, and 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 uh, and it helps obviously with your retirement to make sure that you're putting your money to work. Your money should just not be sitting in a bank account or underneath your mattress. It should be doing something for you. Thank you. Make Veronica. your money work for you, right? That's what yes. I, I keep hearing. I need to figure it out. My my money is on uh, is, is is lazy <laughs> compared to yours. So we, I we can help you, Veronica. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, no. with that, I'm going to hand it back to Tony to close us out. Thanks everyone, and don't feel bad if your um, eyes were rolling in the back of your head as Emmanuel was talking about these issues because he's been talking to me about them for like 20 years, um, and I still don't quite get it. Uh, but uh, I'm lucky to have somebody like Emmanuel that I can go to for advice on how to make money work for me. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for this, Charla. Thank you for all of the amazing um, oradores and oradoras who were. Um, as, as, as Veronica said, vulnerable and at the same time powerful, which is something that everyone should strive to be um, if they wanna be authentic as a, as a communicator. Um, so thank you for everyone that, that took part in this. The different perspectives were amazing. Um, and Veronica, thank you for doing such a great job uh, moderating this. Um, I've been complimenting her on, in private uh, in terms of how much this forum suits her. So, and a thank you to AARP um, and certainly Yvette and the entire team. Uh, and of course, Veronica did double duty, not just supporting us, but actually hosting this. Um, we look forward to the next Charla with AARP and stay tuned for the Charlas that we do every single week on various issues. Uh, check us on our social media and thank you everyone. Appreciate it. Have a great, great weekend and make that money work for you. Problem is you have to have money in the first place and yo no tengo dinero, but we'll do the best we can with what we have.